Hey fellow crickets, last week there has been the request to look at the new SK control deck which Locking pioneered and wrote a guide on Quenty B, so today you'll learn a deck from the creator himself. My name is Locken, I am a content creator and streamer for Team CCG. I stream every day over at twitch.tv slash Games, and today I am really happy to be on Green Cricket's channel, actually showing you a Control SK deck that I wrote a guide for a little bit back. I like the deck a lot, I think it does some really cool stuff, and hopefully you like it and appreciate you checking it out. And you can find me on Twitter at CCGLockin, and try to keep up with me or anything I'm doing with the stream, so... Together with me, we'll look at the card decklist, a mulligan guide, our gameplay plan, an analysis of each matchup, and then Lockin himself will guide us through an example match. Don't forget to vote on next week's deck guide by leaving a comment down below and subscribe if you like what I'm doing. Now, let's go. As the name of the deck suggests, this deck is all about removing enemy engines and playing reactive cards. The only real proactive card is Demon Pirate which discards all his copies from the deck when played, therefore also acting as a thinning tool. However, the core of the deck consists of Diamond Pirate Captains, which are able to pull Demon Pirates, Diamond Warships and Demon Corsairs from the deck. Diamond Warship deals 4 damage to an enemy, and Corsairs lets us resurrect the ship from our graveyard, which includes our Ancrate Whalers, which move an enemy unit to its row, and deals damage depending on how many units are on that enemy's row. Very useful to get units into our Skellige Storm, for example. And if you don't have enough ships, or if you need a big power play for on free, then we can always use Restore onto a Pirate Captain into a Crusader into a ship for a big chunk of value. The last bronze card is Uncreate Armorsmith, enabling us to heal 2 units while adding free armor to them. Especially when the enemy nearly kills our units, Armorsmith is able to generate a ton of value for us and the armor helps against the weather. The Silvers offer more control for cards like Champion of Hoth, who duels an enemy and Vedamarka who either puts Vedder on the board or enables us to play an Alsa's Fender. After Diamond Pirate Captain is thinned from our deck, Morgwag is the highest loyal card in our deck, therefore enabling our leader to pull it consistently in round 1. Morgwag doesn't just die, but returns to the board weakened by half every time it is put on the graveyard, meaning that it will also jump out of the graveyard at the beginning of round 2. Thanks to this carryover, enemies are not able to drive us on us in round 1, which enables some sweet plays to get card advantage which we'll talk about in the gameplay section. Then we have the Haim into Skjall into Spy combination to play Ulderic for only minus 5 points, which helps us to get card advantage more efficiently as well. Since Haim can also create a silver unit from the enemy's deck, you can adapt your playstyle depending on the situation. If you don't use Krach to pull Morkwerk, you can also use Skjall for it, if for example you have Spy in your hand and you want to use the create option from Haim. Coral is a 5 point body artifact compression, useful for more denial, and Burner Brand enables us to put some pressure on the board since she will spawn a Skelliger Storm. Depending on the enemy we are facing, we can use Renew to double play our goals like Burner Brand into long rounds where the enemy can't clear, Coral to deny big buff to units, and Heim if the enemy has silver cards that greatly benefit us. Now let's look at the mulligan. Cards we want to keep are all our golds, Champion of Hoth, Venomicar, and Pirate Captains. Cards we want to get rid of, typically in disparity, Diamond Pirates, because we can pull them with Pirate Captains, Diamond Corsair, since we can't use them in round 1, Ulderic, so we can't pull it with Skjall, Morkwag, so we can pull it with Krach, and if we don't have enough targets for Pirate Captains, we would also get rid of a Diamond Warship. The goal of the mulligan is to have as many playable cards in round 1 as possible. So, how do we play this deck? Depending on our enemy, we need to decide if we want to contest round 1 or if we utilize our carryover to secure card advantage. More about each enemy in the matchup section, but if we commit to contesting round 1, then we need to set up Vedder as early as possible. We use Burner Bran and Vedermaka to get Skellige Storm and Fog or Frost on the board, while our Harpooners enable us to move units into the Vedder. It's okay to sacrifice a bit of tempo in the beginning, because if the enemy passes, then we are able to secure the round, which was our goal anyway, and if we don't sacrifice the tempo in the beginning, then those cards will never see play and we are not able to win in the long round. As soon as the weather is out, we play Krach into Morkwerk and then push with our ships while fitting the deck and setting up our graveyard for later rounds. In the case we don't want to contest round 1, then we need to set up our graveyard for cards like Corsair and Renew and play Krach into Morkwerk to get out of the round. If the enemy wins the round now, then they won't be able to drive pass, forcing them to either play round 2 or cut down or give us card advantage in round 3. 
They may play Spy to ignore our carryover in round 2, so we'll counter that with our Spy, which we have exceptional access to through Adaheim or Skjall. Oh, and another tip. If you play against a potential Sire, then you need to get even more machines into the graveyard or your Corsairs will have no targets after a Sire shuffled two of your machines back into your deck. But since it's a control deck, let's look at concrete situations in the matchup analysis. Great Swords. Let's prevent the Great Swords from happening by using cards like Vatamakar into Alsa's Thunder, Champion of Hoth, and you can even use your ships to remove them. If they Mandrake a damaged Great Sword, then you can still call it, so don't be afraid of doing so. Kill the Great Swords when the count is at 1, and pass when they have finished their Great Sword setup to force them to do the setup again. As long as Morkvag is out of the field, you will even secure card advantage. Keep Armorsmith on hand for when the enemy plays Harald, so you can add free armor to the skull to deny an enemy a big combo. Veterans. Vetter is the key to success, because as soon as veterans are developed, they will outtemper you, but they have no way to remove your Vetter. So the longer the round, the more value Vetter will grant you, enabling you to get ahead. Renew into Burn the Brand is especially useful here. X-Men. Try to contest round 1 as long as possible, so you can play a short round 3 where Vetter can't find that much value. Wait with Morgvark as long as possible as well, otherwise your enemy will try to get rid of it so they can secure card advantage. Use your Whalers to move the X-Men onto rows without units or Vetter, kill them with your champion, and Vettermaker and Coral and Darren should prevent some value as well. Shoop's Quartel. They may clear your Vetter, so only develop one, and let them gamble if they should clear already or wait for your second Vetter to drop. Push with your ships and don't be afraid to lose value by killing Barkley and Tatori. Decoy or the Shoop version of Decoy onto them are quite dangerous, so better prevent them entirely. Renew on Burner offers the biggest value most of the time, since Coral's best target is probably 15 points and time may create cards like Barclay, Hattori or Erlen, which are not very useful for us. Nilfgaard hand buff. Try to contest round 1 and establish better to have a chance against the big units. Coral will find great value in this matchup and the shorter the round is, the more impact does she have. Heim into Peter can give you another reset as well. Alchemy. Alchemy hits Vedder, so establish it early and push round 1. Since all your cards deal damage, Wiper Witches won't be able to unleash the full potential. Their biggest chance is to finish you off with a big combo in a shorter round 3, so try to kill off the Calvage before Mandrick hits and use Heim to create their Sire and shuffle back two Wiper Witches so the ointments don't have targets. If they play third, you can use Crawl to deny its resurrection, which is double sweet when it was buffed up with Markham Ales before. Reveal Reveal have a big push in the beginning, but will have a value problem in run 3, so let them push and when you think they will pass soon, get your Morkwick out to prevent going down a card. Destroy the Mangonels as soon as they appear, and you will also deny lots of value on their end. Your Threaten Murph and Double Scorch won't be a problem as well, since your ships aren't big enough and they will end up scorching their own units instead. Deathwish. There's nothing extraordinary here, so follow the usual game plan and get rid of the Daos. Vedder is very useful, and thanks to Morkberg, you will have a hard time to secure card advantage. Best way new target is Burner most of the time, since Heim doesn't have great targets and your best crawl target is a Cyclops. Keep cold though if they play Monster Nest into a Babagazi. Okay, enough of the fury. Now let me give this over to Lockin, who will showcase the deck in an example match. Okay, hey, we're just gonna go ahead and get right I into it and see who we're facing. Facing Calvi, Calvi can be a lot of things. Of Calvi can notably be 26 card Nova, it can be 26 card Alchemy, there's 25 card Reveal, there's Soldiers. Calvi is truly the quantum leader. He's got so much going on for him. We see 25 cards coming out here from Calvi. So, Soldiers comes to mind or Reveal, both of the two most likely candidates, I think. He could actually be 25 card alchemy. You don't see that too often, but every once in a while it sneaks in. So I'm looking at what I want to do with my hand here. I'm going to kick the Corsair for blacklist reasons. Then I'm going to kick the pirate. And because I see this captain here, I'm feeling very safe to kick that last pirate. So we do have to the coin flip, but that's okay. It's a, This matchup, I think, is almost 100% a win one. if you get red coin. But, you, you know, it's not unwinnable with blue notably the big reason is the queen right here she carries this matchup super hard alchemy doesn't really run ways to deal with this most Nilfgaard decks actually don't really run ways to deal with this so overall i'm feeling pretty okay about the bruna and this matchup just because of the bruna
Time okay. to get our so this is a very important breaking point. My opponent's Witchers do 11 instead of 10, which means that I'm not going to actually really be able to get Armorsmith value this game, and that's a pretty big deal, actually. It's it's sometimes overlooked how big of a deal it is to actually be able to get that Armorsmith value. So we're going to definitely have to keep that in mind. Something else to look at as well, though, is... Morkvarg is a very good card in this matchup. They can't really afford to wipe or witcher it down, and because of that, because they can't really witcher it down, you kind of find yourself in a position where you can effectively of just course, trade into them mustard. very, very well. They can't really afford to trade into any of your units that well. Morkvarg included, even though he is rather tall and would love to, his little resurrect effect here does stop him. So Resur Morkvarg, a card I'm very, very confident in. It's a card that not a lot of people were running in the deck at first, but I think I've kind of gotten more people to come around to it over time. I just think carryover is to such a powerful effect these days, and there's so few decks that actually can even make carryover that it's so fundamentally good. It just abuses the core mechanic of Gwent's round system, and I think Morkvarg is just too good to not run in a deck like this. So notably, the next thing I want to do is I've developed some warships, or sorry, a ship. I've developed more Quark. I'm in an okay position here. The next thing I want to work on is I want to work on getting Burn It Down. I want to be in a spot where I can Here's always win this round, so I don't want to be caught in a situation oh, where I don't know what to do in regards to this Burnout because it's a liability later. So I'm just going to play we it here, even it though it doesn't look way. that good. I'm going to play it up top. And I know this looks weird because I'm not hitting the two units back here. I don't want to kill Viper Witchers this early in the matchup. If you kill them this early, they can actually sometimes win the round against you. And that is a huge no-no. You need them to have to pass to you at some point. So now my opponent's kind of looking at something. And I think the thing he might be looking at here is whether or not he wants to Mandrake my Morkvarg. He seems to be considering it, if nothing else. Just the idea of potentially shutting down my ability to actually have this carryover. It's an interesting thought. I don't hate it on paper. Wow, he actually elected to pass. That's quite interesting. That is very interesting. Okay. So when your opponent passes this early as alchemy, typically what I like to do is there's about there's about two things I like to do here. One, I like to obviously have my spy. I like to have renew for Burna. And I like to have Heim to brick their draws. So we have step one done, which is draw Udoric. We don't have step two, which is renew, but we do have step three. So two out of three isn't bad, but Don't it's not going to cut it. So we're going to have to get a little crafty here. I'm going to go ahead and mulligan here. If you're curious to why I mulligan to the Corsair and not the Udalric back, I want to use Heim on a Seer, and I don't want to lock myself into going Heim into skill. I'm going to go here. He is here. And a bit of an unfortunate discard, you do kind of like to have those Corsairs, but you know... Not the end of the world, it's okay. So I'm gonna play in a few cards here. Notably what I'm doing is I'm gonna develop a graveyard that a seer can't stop. That's kind of the big thing I'm gonna do here is I don't want a seer to be able to stop my graveyard. So I'm gonna develop some cards so that a seer can't beat me and then I'm gonna get out of the round. Won't pay us in gold, pay us in blood. I'm going to go ahead and do this because it thins, and I'm just going to develop these Harpooners, and then I'm going to pass. I want to set up a situation where I can go Restore with Heim, with Hav, and a few Corsairs. You can get to the point where you can shuffle back some Witchers, you can have Renew and a few cards. It's overall just going to be really, really strong for you. Now, how did that incantation go? Of course, my opponent's not sitting on his hands or anything during the whole time we're doing this. So he's going to go ahead and try to develop his own strategy. And my opponent, what he's trying to do is he's trying to thin his deck of all of his bad alchemy cards and try to get down to just the core Kahir, Telekinesis, you know, ointment chains off of Vesemir kind of thing. He wants to set that up and I want to do this. So these are kind of the things that we each want to be doing. And... I'm pretty confident that if we both get to do what we want to do, I will win, just because of the nature of this matchup. 
Okay, so he's elected to play the Cantarella. I think he's trying to force me to pass a little bit. Notably, if he plays a Viper Witcher here, a Viper Witcher is worth 16. So I need to find myself in a position where I can be ahead by 16. Kind of looking at the state of my hand and everything else, I don't have a reliable way to do that much. So instead of what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to pass. I don't have a reliable way to prevent him from catching me in one with Viper Witcher, so I don't really want to try to. I'm just going to pass instead and I'm going to say, you know what, okay, you got me, there it is. So now we're looking at this Renew. Renew is the card that I would really, really love to see here. So big money, no whammies, show me Renew. Right, I forgot about that. Redo, redo, hang on, hang on. Renew. Oh, and the crowd goes wild. Score one for the home team. Unfortunately, just due to the nature of this, I'm gonna have to actually do some weird stuff with the seal that I'll show you in a second. If my opponent actually does some weird stuff with my, with my graveyard, with his Asir, he could actually unbrick my captain, funny enough. This is going to be weird. Given like the situation of the cards we drew, and the situation we find ourselves in, depending on how my opponent does this Asir play, yes. this could get kind of weird. What is it? Okay, he actually shuffled double captain back. Kind of strange. Not the way I would have necessarily done that. I think maybe my opponent made a small misplay, not looking to see the fact that I might not have had any remaining targets in my, in my graveyard. But, you know, that's a tough hand read to make. I can't really... I can't really say one way or the other, so I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to open up with my Burna. This you is a really interesting game. This round three is very, very interesting. My opponent had to make a pretty good read with the Seer. I have to make my own decisions with the Seer. This is a pretty interesting spot to be in. I cannot both brick his ointments and unbrick my captain, so that's pretty. It's a pretty weird spot to be in. I think what I'm going to try to do instead is I'm going to try to use Champion of Hav on a unit that Hav will have to kill himself on, huh, that was and notably, I will then restore him again. Not 100% on that, it's a tough call to make. So if I go Hav and duel this, Hav will kill himself on this novice. The question is, am I always restoring Hav? The thing is here, and this is kind of a, this actually I think is a pretty big thing. If I use Hav here and I don't move this to the back, I'm kind of just missing free points on this novice for no good reason, and I don't really like that. So I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And then next turn, I believe I'm probably just going to go Heim, and I'm going to have to decide what I'm doing with the shuffle. So we have Heim and we have Harpooner is the place we're looking at next. Heim, notably, probably going to be used on a Seer to shuffle a Witcher back, maybe a Warship. It's pretty dicey, honestly, in what we're doing with this with this guy. We follow Letho's lead. That's interesting. So I don't really get any value out of shuffling Witcher now. I'm not too pressed about that so instead of what i'm going to do is i'm going to focus on my own graveyard because this witcher is going to die again meaning i'm not going to be able to block this guy's ointments so i could worship here i could heim i could hov nothing really to harpooner nothing to captain at the moment Yes? What is it? So I'm going to go ahead and shuffle this back so I have a pirate target. And I think I'm just going to shuffle 
Maybe this Udalric back just so that his Kahir is a little bit worse. So my restore here probably going to be used onto Hav if I can get it. If not, my restore is going to get a little dicey. I may have to use my unrestore on a whale, on a whaler even. So interesting spot I find myself in for sure. Time to get our hands dirty. My opponent more than happy to uh, clean that one up for me. What's this on want? I'll just go ahead and ping here. I'm not really in a rush to do anything. I'm always going to have a hob target of some sort. This is just uh This is just me kind of needing to decide what I'm doing with the rest of my hand. This is a very weird spot to be in. See the black blood come down potentially onto a ghoul. There's the ghoul. This could actually be my hov target. So I have to decide. Right now what I can do is I can restore whaler and I can go whaler, move the ghoul out of the row and then move it back with the other one. Or I could just go hov suicide it here and then restore it. So if I go hov suicide, it's a seven point play and then I restore and it's an eight and then the eight is worth about 16 or 17. So I'm using my two silvers to do 25-ish. That's just not that much. It's honestly just better to take the whaler. So I'm just gonna go ahead here. And honestly, just to play around Vic over our medic, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and commit this now. I'm gonna play around Expired Ale a little bit. I don't think Expired Ale is enough of a concern to make me play around it. I do think that card is quite bad. Um, but, you know, it never hurts to be you know safe, so I'll play around it here. Not any reason to not. It, not like Dragon's Dream is really a card that I'm supposed to play around, I don't think so. If this guy has Dragon's Dream, I guess he's earned the win. So right now we're just seeing that this value over time weather is really grinding him down. His last few cards are going to be, be packing a decent amount of punch. Notably, my opponent didn't thin that well though. Only 10 cards. Well, I, what I should say rather is he only thinned 5 chance. cards coming into the final round. So a pretty big deal, I would say overall, how little my opponent thinned. It might inhibit his ability to actually find his cards like Telekinesis and Kahir. He took such an early pass in round one, I just don't know if he thinned enough to find what he's looking for here, so we'll have to see. I couldn't break any ointments, obviously a bit of a, a bummer, but not the end of the world. Looking at Warship and Hob as our finishers here. So here comes Kahir. Roach jumping into the back row as well, kind of interesting. So I guess potentially not moving this and sitting on the Harpooner next extra turn could have gotten me a few extra points, maybe. I shall not repeat. Ooh, that's instance. definitely not what he wanted to see. So here we see another effect of him row stacking like this is he's actually crippling himself a little bit here with this play, which is rather interesting. I'm actually going to do a bit of a cute play here that might cost him an extra point. I'm going to kill this Witcher so that when the weather goes off, it kills here. so that if his last card is Vilgefortz, he actually has to burn the Asir. It probably doesn't matter, but it's kind of a cute play that maybe makes him burn an extra point. So I kind of like the idea of it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Worst case scenario, it gets me an extra. You know, worst case scenario, it doesn't matter. And then best case scenario, it's a free point and points Come add up. Forward, enough. Okay, if this is a Mandrake, he will go ahead and use it on Asir. So there goes that. Come over here and I duel this guy. And we barely, just barely, grind this guy out in a real nail biter. So we saw it there, we lost coin flip, we didn't have a phenomenal restore, he got insane ointment value that game. 
but it didn't matter because alchemy just cannot compete with the grindy nature that this deck has. This deck's just ability to just put out this value over time game plan while abusing cards like Restore, I'm and Demon Pirate Captain is pretty insane. I think the Demon package definitely carries this deck. So I hope that kind of showcased a little bit of what the deck can do, specifically against a deck like Alchemy, a deck that's really, really popular in ladder right now because of how it does into swords. Interestingly enough, this deck also is very happy to queue into swords because of how much removal and grindy nature it has. A big thanks to all my patrons for making this possible. And also big thanks to Locking. Check him out. I'll include his social links down in the description below. Also the link to his guide on QuintDB. If you're looking for more Quint content, then check out my other videos as well. And subscribe if you like what I'm doing. Thanks for watching.